Our Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for the love that you have shown us and you have demonstrated your own love for us in this while we were still sinners. Christ Jesus died for us. Father, we praise you and we thank you for that gift that we would never and could never and do not deserve. Father, as we enter into a time of, of looking at your word, I pray that your Holy Spirit would take your word and apply it to our hearts, that our hearts would be open, that our hearts would be receptive, that our hearts would be fertile ground. I pray, Father, for those who are here today who are not yet sure in terms of where they stand in their relationship with you. I pray that today might be the day, Father, that they leave here having placed their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And for those of us, Father, who profess your name, I ask that today would be a day of, of revival and Holy Spirit, that you would just awaken within us a, a greater desire to become more and more like our Lord and Savior. And I specifically want to pray for our families here today, Lord. As we look at this topic and as we talk about today the parent-child relationship, I just pray your blessings on these families, Lord. And I pray that you would help those of us who are parents to shepherd well. And I pray for every young person who is here today, they would understand that, that your design for family and the parents that you've given them is actually a wonderful gift of grace. I just pray your blessings on this time, and I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. I bless you. Please be seated. Uh, we are continuing our series this month of January and getting uh, focusing on first things, those things that are most important. And today, uh, we're building on what we started last week, and last week we were looking at the husband-wife relationship. Today, we're looking at the parent-child relationship. Now, if you're here and you're saying, well... You know, I don't have any kids, so this doesn't apply to me. If you're a grandparent, you can be an encouragement to someone else. And if you're not married, you can be an encouragement to someone else. And maybe one day you will be married and you will have kids. But above all, I pray today that we will see that God knows what he's doing and he is pursuing each and every one of us. He's pursuing you. Before I get any further, not now, but because now would be kind of a weird time to do it. But before you leave, I didn't want to embarrass you, but... Someone named Peter had a birthday yesterday. So when he, before you leave, I want you to go give him a hug. Or if you're uncomfortable with that, you can shake his hand or pat his back or do the bro thing or whatever. But uh, we want to say happy birthday to you, Peter. Okay? And uh, you all please do that after church. And uh, don't let him get out without, without that, all right? All right. How many of you are parents? Wow. <laughs> Young people, how many of you are, you have parents? <laughs> that makes up most of our group here today. I never will forget in 1992 when Priscilla and I were leaving Kingwood Hospital and our first child. Now we, we went through all the, the things that you go through, all the classes, and you know, I'd seen the ultrasound and everything else. All the things you're supposed to do. I was there, got to cut the umbilical cord, all those great cool things. But there was something about having my son Christian in that child seat, in the car, and us leaving the hospital. And I never forget when I was driving, I was on the way home, I'm excited, but I'm also thinking, oh my soul, this is real. <laughs> Anybody familiar with that weird feeling when you leave, right? All their books, everything that you've read, this is now real. It's very, very real. Parenting is not easy work, it's hard work. It's on the job training continually. And it's from one phase to the next of their lives. You read the scriptures, you go to conferences, you watch videos, read books, you go listen to podcasts, listen to Christian radio. There's nothing, nothing wrong with all those things. You do all that you can when you're preparing to be a parent. And when you are a parent, you're trying to soak in as much as you can. But the reality is it's not as easy, it's not as seamless as uh, the claims made by some. Uh, some of the experts who make a lot of money uh, off of their books on parenting that if you do these things, if you take these steps, your kids will turn out great. You'll be a fantastic parent. There'll be wonderful order and happiness at all times. Never rebellion. You'll win parent of the year. Your children will be model children for all the world to behold. You'll never have stress or problems. Always summer, never winter, and so on and so forth, right? Now, you and I know it's not that easy and it's not that simplistic. So let's think with me about some of the things that are just, some of the things that are taking place in that family dynamic between parent and children, okay? First of all, every child is different. 
Second, if you're a Christian and you're married with kids, you've got a lot going on in here. So let's unpack just a few things. First of all, individually, you have your own stuff that you're dealing with. Amen? You do. As you seek to grow in Christ's likeness, so you've got your stuff. And your spouse, he or she has their stuff they're dealing with as they seek to grow in the Lord. And that both of you have your stuff that you're trying to deal with as you grow together as a couple and as a husband and wife, as we looked at last week. You're still imperfect. You still wrestle with sin, don't you? When we all do on this side of eternity. So we have that going on. And then there's other things that are taking place. There's bills to pay. Emergencies happen. And happen. And happen. Work is going on. Work continually is going on. And then you have your children. Now as precious as your children are, if they're not yet Christians, they're still fallen sons and daughters of Adam and they still have a sin nature, so they're wrestling with their own stuff. And they're going through all kinds of stuff that they go through also in their own respective life stages on top of that. And when they become Christians, they also have stuff that they're in process too. So you put all this stuff together and boy, a lot is going on. A lot is going on with everybody. Now, I'm not trying to freak you out or make it sound overly com uh, complex or, or whatnot, but I do want to avoid that simplistic notion when people tell you, hey, you know what? We've got it all figured out. I've got this book. I read it. It has 12 steps, 15 steps. If you do it, bingo, perfect kids. Everything is great. I run away from people like that like crazy. It's like, you know, okay, yeah, God bless you. It's not, that's not the way it is. That's not the way things work. We live in a fallen, broken world. We haven't even talked about spiritual warfare. Nor have we addressed even how people are wired differently. Your children and you are all wired differently. You have the introvert, the extrovert, the extra sensitive, the completely insensitive, the pliable one, the teachable one, the stubborn kid who's stubborn as all get out. Parents, don't raise your hand or say amen around your kids. <laughs> you have all these things taking place. The good news is there's hope. The same God that we looked at last week who has a design for marriage has a design for the parent and child relationship. Okay? And we're going to look at that today. We're going to look at some big picture things today. Hopefully some takeaways uh, that will encourage you as parents. And if you're a child, if you're a young person, I'll have some things I want to say to you. Okay? Don't make, me, don't make me call you out in front of mom and dad. That'd be really bad, right? I'm just joking. I'm not going to dead to you. But I got your attention, though. I noticed that. But there's some things I hope we all leave here today going, okay, I, I get this now. All right, I get this. This is important. So as we look at the family, we're going to look at parents and children. So turn to Ephesians chapter 6. We're looking at verses 1 through 4. Ephesians 6, 1 through 4. And then we're going to unpack a few things here. And then we're going to cross-reference this with another passage. The Apostle Paul is writing after he's dealt with the husband-wife relationship. He says this, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. Parenthetically, this is the first commandment with a promise. That it may go well with you, and that you may live long in the land. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. A few quick points. Children. That Greek word there in, uh, referring to children is specifically referring to those children who are living under your roof, mom and dad. So if you're married and your kid's, you know, 30 or whatever on their own, this does not mean they're still supposed to run around, you know. Remember the whole leave and cleave thing? They've left and cleft, hopefully. All right? And they're married and they're building their own family. This refers to children who are still living under your roof, under your authority. And children, here's what God's Word says. Obey your parents in the Lord. And you knew that was coming. And some of you are like, oh man, he's going to talk about that. Well, we're going to talk about it. Really, it's not a burden. It's actually a blessing. Okay? Obey your parents in the Lord. God wants children to willingly submit to the authority of their parents, recognizing that your parents are agents of the Lord, that the Lord has placed over you for your own good. Now, I know the way, because I remember being a teenager. I know that. And I have kids who grew up, and they're, well, they're not grown, grown up, but they're, they're 20 and they're 23. And I know what some of you are thinking. My parents? You don't know my parents. Everybody else has great parents. My parents are dorks. They don't get it. They don't know what so on and so forth. 
I'm not going to address that, but I'm going to tell you why. God gave you the parents He gave you out of His sovereign goodness because He loves you, okay? Obey your parents in the Lord. God has placed your parents over you for your own good. God wants children to obey their parents as they would obey the Lord. You see, obedience is something that you learn. You learn, and like you learn how to obey your parents, it's going to be how you learn how to obey God. What's implied in this section here is, first of all, a few things that are important. That when Paul is writing to the church in Ephesus, the implication is is that everyone, the parents, are Christians. That's the first thing. All right, that your mom and dad are Christians, that they're walking with the Lord, that they are filled with the Spirit, that mom and dad are working out their relationship according to the biblical design for marriage. We talked about that last week. The father being the spiritual leader, serving his wife, living for her sanctification, putting her needs first. The wife respecting her husband. That all of this is going on and ultimately done out of submission to Christ. The thing here for all of you who are children is that your parents are to train you to walk with God and to learn to obey the Lord. And you as a child or a young person are learning how to live under the authority of the Lord as you learn how to live under the authority of your parents. That relationship with your parents is, uh, be what your, is to reflect whether that relationship is you're to have with God. Now kids, I want to address the big elephant or young people, I'm sorry. Uh, the, the big elephant that's in the room for some of you. No, your parents are not perfect. Okay? No parent is. Because I know that some of you are thinking, wow, you know what? You don't know my parents. They're not, they're not perfect. They're not all, it, it, hey, there's no one here that would claim to be perfect. All right? And I want to say this is a quick sidebar. For those of you, and, I, and, and this is a whole separate sermon, there are some of you I'd be willing to bet in a room this size, some of you grew up with a parent or parents who were the exact opposite of everything that we're looking at in Scripture. It may have been abusive. It may have been a very horrific upbringing. And for that, I want you to know a couple of things. One, I'm very, very sorry if that is your story. Two, God is able to redeem and to heal everything. Okay? And we can unpack this at another time for those of you who grew up in that context. I'm very sorry, but know this. God is still sovereign, still in control, still good, and He loves you, and He's able to heal. And some of you today, if that's, if that's your takeaway, as you listen to this text, as you read this text, maybe it's sim simply praying to your perfect Heavenly Father, Lord, would you please heal the past? Because I didn't grow up with this. Now, Back to the children. No, your parents are not perfect. It does not mean that you are to say, well, you know what, mom and dad, you're messed up so I can rebel and do what I want to do. No. Now, there is an exception in which you, uh, it would be implied in Scripture, and we see this throughout Scripture, actually. The one time that you're not to, you know, obey your parents would be if your mom or dad asks you to do something immoral or that directly contradicts God and His Word. But other than that, you're expected to obey your parents. Your parents are not perfect. Let me give you a few things that they have probably have told you, but maybe it's good to hear from somebody else. Your parents aren't perfect, but they've lived longer than you have. I'll give you some reasons why obedience is kind of a good thing before we get to the, the big picture about what God says here. They've lived longer than you have. They have a much broader perspective on life and reality because they've lived longer than you have. They see complex issues a lot more clearly because their brains are fully developed. They have experience. They've been there. They've done that. And some of them had the t-shirt for it multiple times. And they see you going down the same path. They once went down. It's like, wait a minute. I know where this goes. And you need to trust them. Okay? They do know and they do care. Ideally, they have wisdom that you don't have yet because you... I mean, you can't have the wisdom when you're 6, 7, or 12, or 14, or 16, or 18 that, you, that someone does when they're 40 or 50. They've been around for a little bit. Does that make sense? I mean, wisdom is something that also comes with walking with God through time. So for these reasons and many more, why do you obey your parents? Because God ultimately says this is right according to the text. This is right. This is pleasing to God. This is God's design. It's right in God's eyes. Here's a fact, young people. I need you to hear this. You cannot be pleasing to God and living a life of rebellion against your parents. You can't do both at the same time. 
You can't. That relationship with your parents matters supremely to God. It would be like a husband saying, oh, I love Jesus, but my wife, I'm not going to love her, I'm not going to care for her. Or a, or a wife saying about her husband, oh, I just love the Lord, but I'm not going to love and respect my husband. Those are rebelling against God and His Word and His pattern and His design. So young people, your relationship with God is intertwined with your relationship with your mom and dad and what you do or do not do in terms of obeying and honoring them. So what does God want? He wants you to honor your father and mother, the text says. Now, when he says honor, this honoring deals with your attitude. It's an attitude of the heart. Honoring your parents is not just you being a robot. Not just saying, yes, okay, well, whatever, mom and dad, I'll, I'll do that because you want me to. It's really a disposition, an attitude of the heart. So you need to pray, Lord, help me to have an attitude within my heart where I want to honor my parents, where I want to do what they have told me to do because this is right and this is what's pleasing to you. When you get your heart right with God, young people, you're going to take that relationship with your parents very, very seriously. And I pray you do take that very seriously. You're going to desire to honor them because it is an attitudinal thing, something that God will do in your heart. He accomplishes in your heart. Now, Paul continues here with an encouragement because some of you children or some of you young people are saying, man, okay, I get it. We're supposed to honor and obey our parents. We're supposed to, I, I, yes, yes, yes. Now, now, talk to my mom and dad. Well, interesting you brought that up. Paul does. He trans, uh, he, and we'll get there in a second. But Paul says, one more encouragement to you. This is the first commandment with a promise. When he says to honor and to obey your parents, for this is right. This is the first commandment with a promise. Even though submitting to your parents should be an attitude of the heart, you do this ultimately to honor God. Now, what Paul is quoting when he says this is the first commandment with a promise, he's actually quoting something that's written out of Exodus chapter 20, verse 12. That promise was that it may go well with you in the land, and you may, excuse me, that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. It's a special promise of blessing for children who obey their parents, who honor their parents when they do what God desires. God's going to bless that. It's a promise that God is saying, I will be with you in a very special way as you honor your parents because you're honoring God and your parents and that pleases God. Now we transition now to the, to the parents. Paul says here, fathers, he transitions here, but that word in the Greek technically refers to male parents, but it was often also used broadly in parents in general, both to the mom and the dad. So parents, check this part out because it's important. Verse 4, fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Now, we talked about this part of the text over Father's Day, and we're going to hit some different facets. We'll have a few different application points, but parents... It's incumbent upon us that we recognize that God says specifically to us that we are not to provoke our children to anger, but rather we're to bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. God wants us to bring our children up that they might know Him, that they might walk with Him, that they might desire Him. And He warns us very clearly, do not provoke your children because doing so will lead them the exact opposite way, the exact opposite direction as opposed to seeking relationship and desiring relationship with me. Now, how, what does He mean when He talks about provoking and what are some ways that we can provoke our kids? Now, this is not an exhaustive list, but these are a few that I've seen over the years. Here are some ways parents can exhaust or provoke rather parents provoke their children. One, tell them how important it is to love, know, and obey God, but you yourself don't, don't do so. In other words, do as I say, not as I do. Compartmentalize Jesus. Say, hey, it's really important that we, we, all, we all love Jesus, that we all make sure that we're in church, and so on and so forth, that we're all walking with God, but you kind of live life on your own terms. Another way you can provoke your children, talk about the gospel, but be very legalistic. Legalism adds to the gospel, and in doing so, this is very much going to confuse your kids on grace and whether it's true that God's love is actually perfect. Another way that we provoke our kids is that we tell them how amazing this Jesus is, how amazing the gospel is, but they themselves feel like they have to continually perform at home in order to earn love or approval. Did you catch that? Mom and dad? 
If your kids feel like I have to work hard so mom and dad will love me, we are sending a very dangerous message to them and they're going to, in time, impose that on God. Another way to provoke your kids, try to create them in your own image. Live vicariously through them. Make Johnny be everything you never were in high school. Make Susie everything you never were in high school. Another way to provoke them, withhold forgiveness. Another one, hold grudges. Withhold affection until they perform. Neglect their basic needs. Spin on yourself first. I've actually seen this and had to talk with parents about this. Another way to provoke your kids, don't give them your time. Just throw money at them. There you go. You know, I'm busy, I don't have time, but here you go. You can't replace time, man. Another way is to not say, I love you, just assume they'll figure it out. You know how many adults that I have talked to over the years that say, you know, I, and oftentimes this comes in the context of when someone, one of their parents is in the hospital or we're getting close to the funeral. I never, I never heard, and it's often dad, well, I've heard mom. I never just once I would have loved to have heard him say, I, I love you. Three simple but very profound and very needed words. You can't say it enough. You, can't, you just can't. Another way to provoke your kids is never say, I'm sorry. Never say, never admit you're wrong. <laughs> I'm the parent. I don't have to. You know what? You're going to model. If you model humility and say, hey, you know what? I was wrong. Please forgive me for that. That goes a long way. When you don't, your kids pick up on it. Another way to provoke your kids, yell at them. Take out all your frustration from work and everything else on your kids. The polar opposite of that, try to bubble wrap your kids and helicopter over them continually. No bad will ever come to my child. The sad thing is, is that on college campuses the past, as we saw Generation Y shift from Generation YI, some of the things that are amazing that I never thought that I would see. Parents calling professors, arguing with professors over grades. We've had reports and stories of parents calling, you know, Johnny, I keep using Johnny because I'm trying to be vague. Johnny graduates from college and Johnny gets his first job. Johnny's worked there a year, but Johnny didn't get a raise and mom or dad calls the employer. Now, this isn't funny. I mean, it's funny, but it's not. The helicoptering parent does no one any good because sooner or later they get in the real world. You know how many times I saw, especially my last few years on our college campuses, how many times I saw kids that had been helicoptered to the point that they almost had a, a, a pure meltdown being on a college campus when they were surrounded by lostness. They didn't know what to do. They were freaking out. And they were freaking out because mom and dad, their whole lives, had bubble wrapped them and protected them. And I was like, okay, you're off at college. I hope it works out well for you. They had not equipped them. The real world will come, and you, mom and dad, you know the real world will come, and it will hit you hard, will it not? So you, yes, we, I'm not telling you to, you know, free-range parent, let your kids do whatever they want to do. Remember we went through that period, like in the whatever it was? Whatever he feels like doing, express himself, I think that's just so great. That turned out pretty good, didn't it? <laughs> no, it turned out really bad. But the, then we, the pendulum swung the other way, and there was bubble wrapping and helicoptering. And what you find, I'm just going to tell you, I've seen it too many times. You either get the kid who's shell-shocked when reality hits, or you get the kid who's like, you know what? I am free. Mom and dad, adios. I'm telling you, don't provoke your kids that way. I've seen a lot over the past 29 years. I want to address something because this is, this is something that's really big in terms of their relationship to God and the church. I need you to hear this, okay? Moms and dads. It's a big one. One of the reasons that Johnny and Susie in record numbers are dropping out of church when they go off to college and they don't come back, here's what I've noticed a lot over the years. I'm not speaking about anybody here, okay? Just telling you 29 years, you see enough, right? Mom and dad say they love Jesus, they talk about Jesus, and they talk really badly about the church. Go to services, say praise the Lord, God bless your brother. Listen to the message, sing songs, go to Bible study, pray, get in the car, go out to eat or go home for lunch, whatever, and then start complaining around the kids how much you didn't like the music the music minister. 
often like the message. The Sunday school teacher, the deacon. I didn't like that way that guy was in the front greeting. I don't like brother so-and-so. Mom and dad, you are the very first line of ministry to your kids. Don't outsource that to the church. But understand this, that your kids are going to pick up on a lot of things about the bride of Christ, which is this church, from you and how you talk about it. Gossiping about brother, sister, and so and so. Jesus died for the church. There is no perfect church, but Jesus loves his bride, so don't you dare trash it in front of your kids. You're going to end up with kids who are very jaded and cynical about the church. Illustration. I'm a youth minister. I won't say where because this person may be seeing it. Uh, <laughs> you never know how things work um, when the video is posted. It was during the, the age of Nirvana and Pearl Jam. Remember the grunge age with all the ripped jeans and the flannel shirts and the, you know, all, the, all the teen angst and all that kind of stuff, right? I get a phone call from a mom in church. And the mom wants me to meet with her son. She homeschools her son. This is not a statement on homeschooling whatsoever. I'm just giving you a context. And, and the appearance of this family was everything was just neat and nice and tidy, so on and so forth. I really need you to talk with so-and-so. We'll just call him Johnny, too. Since everybody else has been Johnny. I need you to talk with Johnny. I'm really struggling with Johnny. He doesn't he didn't really want to be at church. And he just, he's just so rebellious. I don't know what to do. And can you, he seems alike. Can you talk to him? I'm like, okay, I'll do my very best, you know. And she just wants to bring him by the office, and, and he comes walking in. You know, he's got the, all the, all the, the, the whole nine yards, the whole outfit on. And he plops down, and he looks at me. And I shut the door, and I'm like, hey, man, so what's going on? It was the most awkward, like, we're, she was supposed to pick up in like an hour. It was like the most awkward hour. We're sitting there. He didn't want to talk, and he's just kind of leaned back. And he's looking at me. We make some small talk. I'm trying to find any entry point to talk with him. Some small talk. We get some of that done. Then eventually it's like, man, you know, Johnny, your mom's going to be here pretty soon. <laughs> we gotta, you're going to have to say something that you talked about, right? I mean, what, 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 what did we talk about? And then he drops this. And I can still, I was telling him, so it's like, it's, been, it's stuck with me ever since. He looks at me and he goes, I'll tell you what's going on. My dad's a hothead. He's a control freak. He does it at work, does it at home. He's always mad. My mom, the biggest gossip I know. She talks bad about everybody. She talks bad about you. She talks bad about everybody, the church staff. He said, and so we have this shiny image that we come to church together and so on and so forth. He goes, it's so freaking fake. And he used a lot of words I cannot use. He's just dropping in my office. And he goes, so you're supposed to fix that. <sighs> 16 years old. He saw through all that. And everything he said was true. The more I got to know his parents. Mom and dad, it starts with you and it starts at home. You were the primary disciple makers of your children. And how you talk about the bride of Christ is also really important. I need you to understand that. It's going to have an impact on your kids. It starts at home. Everything starts at home. You're going to make mistakes, but you've got to understand that your children are going to catch your Christianity as much as they hear it taught. They're going to catch it just as much as they hear it taught. They need to see you model it. Okay? Parents, do not provoke your children. Now, we look at this kid who's supposed to obey your parents and moms and dads were to bring our children up in the instruction of the Lord. Children are supposed to obey because this honors God. So there's this dynamic here. And there's a text I want you to turn to real quickly. What does some of this look like? How can some of this play itself out in a way that doesn't come across where mom and dad are running around beating, you know, with the kids with the King James, the big family King James Bible and, and whatnot, where it's actually healthy and where there's actual conversation going on to where Christ is at the center of this house? Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 9. It's one of my very favorite little passages on some principles that I think that we can wrap this up with in terms of application points. <clears throat> Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently. You catch that, parents? Teach them diligently, I mean, faithfully, regularly, routinely. 
to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign in your hand and they shall be as frontless between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. The quick background when God is shaping Israel as his chosen people, he wants them to know him and to think correctly about him. The Lord your God is one. They were surrounded by polytheistic cultures. God says, know this, there is one God, I am him, and he also wants his children to know the only appropriate response to him is to love him with all their heart, soul, might, with all their strength. It's not to be some external, just uh, outward religion, it's our worship in spirit and in truth. He expects us to hide, he expects his children to hide his word in their hearts, to act on those words, and to pass those words along to their children so their children might know. Now let's see how this plays out. It's a lifestyle of walking together. Look at verses 7. Uh, and following, you shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when? When you sit in the house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise. You catch this? This is huge. You talk about these things with your kids when you're home, when you're out and about, throughout the day. Keep these words and these truths before you. Build your homes, build your relationship on God and His words. Application, what would that look like? Let me give you a few things to consider. First of all, I really pray and encourage you as parents, have a time each day when your family gathers together to pray together. Everybody come together and we're going to pray together, okay? I also encourage you, and, and I'm real careful about saying X amount of times per week or so on and so forth because some people will turn this into a list of things to do that becomes a checklist and very legalistic, but I do believe it's very important whether you're doing it daily or you're doing it a few times during a week where your family has a family devotion time, you and the kids, you know what? There's a lot of great books, a lot of resources you can use. My favorite one is called the Bible, and you can use that. You can start, if you want to, with the stories of Jesus. You can start, and you just spend time. And, and, and the thing that we had to wrestle with with our kids as they got older, a little bit, when, when Christian's four years older than Hannah, and so what we noticed in, in terms of their relationship at different times, Christian was ready to talk about some things that Hannah wasn't quite yet ready to talk about, so we sometimes had this, this you know, think about it. Where are we going to focus? And sometimes we hit it, sometimes we didn't, but you know what? The kids knew that we would get together and we were going to go through and we were going to talk and we were going to pray and that was just a part of what, what happened in the light. And just so you'll know, Priscilla and I were not perfect parents and we made plenty of mistakes. We can look back and wow, I wish we'd done that differently. We're blessed our kids are where they are by the grace of God, so I'm not holding myself or my wife up and saying, do what we did. We're perfect because no one again is. I want to make sure you're clear on that. Three, here's where a lot of parents miss this in terms of uh, these big moments as you are going about daily life. Say you're in the car, you're on your way to the store or to an athletic event or to school when you're running errands. Those times that you're together and you're doing work, there are so many teachable times. And it's not about you saying, okay, teachable time, we're in the car. Let's go through the doctrine of justification. I've got you trapped in here for 30 minutes and we're going to just really pound this into your head. This is a time to talk. It's a time to listen. It's a time to hear what's going on with your kids and say, how does God, gospel, the word of God intersect with what we're going through right now? Sometimes it's pointing out certain things and just letting God shape that conversation. But in other words, you're very careful and you're very intentional to not waste those moments. They're precious. And sometimes the drive time in the car, if you're honest, right, moms and dads? Sometimes the drive time in the car is not a holy time. It's like everybody get your boxing gloves on and your mouthpiece in because we're going to get rowdy in here. That can be an awesome time, a great time. Take advantage of it. Never forget that all those times you're together are wonderful times in which you can talk about God and gospel and Jesus and life. You know what some of my very favorite times were when my kids were growing up? Absolutely, when they were living at home, when we were out and about, man, that they might hear something or they read something or something happened that day and we would just talk about what does God have to say about those things? You know? And mom and dad, if you're going to do that, that means something important. You're going to have to spend a lot of time in God's Word. You can't fake it till you make it. You want to give your kids truth. Okay? 
But man, I miss those times. We talk about everything from mu music, movies, basketball, uh, friends, big life issue, boys, girls, all those things taking place in the context of the car or when we're out and about and it was just a natural thing if you really pour into it. Before you know it, those conversations just, they, they just happen. And, and, it's, and they're wonderful and they're holy and they're good. But you've got to be intentional. Don't miss out on those moments. They're precious. Whenever I hear a parent say something about their younger child, oh, I can't wait till they get older. It's just such, they're so busy. Man, slow your roll, mom and dad. That's a pro. Every age is precious. They're going to get old enough soon enough. You enjoy this time. Each time has its own challenges. And when I hear parents, they're like, oh, I got the terrible twos. I cannot wait till they're older. It's like, oh yeah, well, yeah you're going to have a lot of fun when it gets a little bit older. It gets a lot more interesting, more complex. Enjoy it. Be intentional. Every morning, mom and dad, you start your day off and you ask, Lord, please help me to be the, if I am in my case, Lord, help me to be the man and the husband and the father I am to be. Help me to be open to all these opportunities that are going to be around me that I will have today to bless my wife and to bless my children. When you start doing that with intentionality and in focus, guess what? More of these opportunities start to pop up. And you start as soon as you're, as soon as you're, as soon as you're able. You know, when Christian was little and we lived in Wisconsin, <laughs> one of my favorite stories, um, just because of the kids, right? There'd be different things that we would, we, we'd, we'd go walk around our block, we'd go take walks, and we'd just have man talks. You know, he's like three or four, like pilling around. I remember one day we were walking. I'm trying to remember how we got on the topic, but I said, well, Christian, you tell me, what is sin? What do, what do you think sin is? We're walking around and he thinks, and his best friend's name was Trevor. He goes, Trevor's a sinner. <laughs> <laughs> and I go, well, 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 I'm not asking if Trevor's a sinner. I'm asking, have you ever sinned? Trevor's a sinner. <laughs> I said, well, Christian, okay, okay, Trevor's a sinner, but have you ever sinned? And so we started talking about what, what sin is and what. I said, have you ever not done something that God wants you to do? Or have you ever done something that God says you're not supposed to do? Yes, sir. But Trevor does it a lot. <laughs> and you start to get an insight in terms of these kids and how they think, you know? But I never will forget that. That was so awesome. I can still today at 23 bring it up. Hey, man, Trevor, is he still sinning? You know, and it's okay, and we can joke about that. But all those conversations as they're growing up, don't miss out on those. Don't just, the worst thing you can do, mom and dad, with your kids, is to say, well, you know, uh, I'm just bringing them to the church, so the church is supposed to teach them that stuff. We're here to support what, what you're doing. That's on you, mom and dad, first. You walk with God, you ask God for grace, and we're here to, to help support that, but we do not take the place of the family. Okay? Last thing. As you're being attentive, when these moments pop up, and they will a lot, just keep reminding yourself that everything with uh, this whole child-parent relationship is always going to be a work in process. And again, sometimes you're going to go, wow. You're going to come home and you're going to say, that was amazing, Lord. What an unbelievably holy and awesome time. And sometimes you're going to come and get through these times and say, wow, I really, I think I dropped the ball here and there and 25 other places today. You lean on the Word of God. You lean on the grace of God. I pray that you have Christian friends that you can also ask to help encourage you along the way. You're not going to be a perfect parent, but don't use that as an excuse to say, you know what, it doesn't matter then. No, it matters supremely. I want to ask us to do something. I want us to, to bow our heads. And this is an opportunity. We're having a different kind of invitation today. This is an opportunity, uh, moms, dads, children. It's an opportunity for, for you to, to come together and to say we're a family. And we just want to honor the Lord <laughs> and His design. Either committing our family to the Lord or in some cases maybe is this a time to recommit your family to the Lord? Or husbands and wives, if last week maybe you just want to recommit your marriage to the Lord? When we have our invitation, this is going to be an open front. 
And if you are here and you just want to come forward and just say, hey, we just want to pray with our family. Let's do that. You grab your, grab your spouse or grab your kids and just, just go pray. If you're here and you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ personally and you want to know what that's like and you want to have a personal relationship with Him and you want to know how do you do that, you too, leave your chair and just come forward and we'll share with you how you can leave here today changed. We won't embarrass you or anything like that. If you're looking for a church home and you believe this is where God wants you to be, I also want to invite you. Just come forward and say, yeah, I'd, I'd like to join with this church and we'll share with you how you can do that. This time of invitation is an opportunity for all of us to respond to the Lord. Okay? So however it is that the Holy Spirit is impressing upon you, I just want to encourage you to do uh, whatever it is He's leading you to by saying, yes, Lord. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day and I thank you again for moms and dads. I thank you for these children. I thank you for your grace. I thank you for your word, God. I thank you for your patience with us. I thank you for your faithfulness. Lord, I just pray that you would be glorified in each of our lives. I pray for our families again, that you would be glorified in each and every family. I pray for those who are here today who are just really struggling with where they stand with you. I pray today that they would just let go and say, Lord, I, I just want to follow you. Father, we be glorified in this time of invitation. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.